welcome Dr. Terry Walls to the show once again. I am so thrilled to have you and I'm so thrilled to hear about the most current resource, not only in regards to multiple sclerosis, but also autoimmune disease, especially because it has a profoundly disproportionate effect on women and that who's listening mm-hmm. to this show. And so I wanted to just start off. I know you had been on the show a couple of years ago, but as a refresher, just I'd love for you to share kind of what was the defining moment for you to dig so deeply into this work around multiple sclerosis? So I want to tell the story in real time as it happens. So in medical school, I started having electrical face pains. I can tell they're worse with stress, poor sleep. Uh, They gradually are more frequent, more severe, and will ultimately be diagnosed as trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, Then uh, 20 years after they begin, I start having weakness in my left leg. And I see the neurologist who says, Terry, this could be bad or really, really bad. I go through work up for the next uh, three weeks and I hear the term multiple sclerosis, see the best people, take the newest drugs. But I continue to decline. The face pains continue to worsen. And three years later, I hear tilt recline wheelchair. My trigeminal neuralgia is much worse. I am introduced to the paleo diet by my neurology team. And I adopt that, but I continue to worsen. And that's when I go back to reading the basic science, uh, reading PubMed. And I decide that the the mitochondrial dysfunction drives disability. I create a supplement cocktail for my mitochondria, which helps my fatigue a little bit. The speed of my decline slows. I'm very grateful. But by 2007, I cannot sit up anymore in a regular chair. I'm in a zero gravity chair. I'm beginning to have brain fog. My face pains are far uh, more severe, more difficult to turn off. I discover a study using electrical stimulation of muscles. I convince my physical therapist to let me try it. Test session hurts bad, really quite bad. But when it's over, I feel great. And we add e-stim to my physical therapy. Then I discover the Institute for Functional Medicine. I take their course on neuroprotection. I have a longer list of supplements and I am adding those. I've been doing the paleo diet for five years. And then I had this really big aha, and I'm actually embarrassed by how long it took me to have this aha. What if I redesigned my paleo diet based on this long list of nutrients that I'm taking in supplement form? That's more research. I get that sorted out and I start this new way of eating uh, December 26, 2007. Now at that time, I'm, I'm beginning to have brain fog. Uh, that's much more severe. I know I'm going to have to finally apply for medical disability. I can walk just a few steps using two walking sticks. Otherwise, I'm in this zero gravity chair with my knees higher than my nose. I cannot sit up more than 10 minutes. It's clear I'm headed towards becoming bedridden, demented, and probably soon living with intractable electrical face pain. And I start this new way of eating. I'm doing e And I'm doing all this to slow my decline because I know that with progressive MSU functions once lost are not coming back. And to my amazement, by the end of January, I realized that my mental clarity is improving, my fatigue is reducing, and my physical therapist says, Terry, you're definitely stronger. I'm going to advance your exercises. You can now do 10 minutes twice a day. And then I can do 15 minutes twice a day, and then 20 minutes twice a day, and then 30 minutes twice a day. And then I start sneaking in a little exercise sessions while I'm at work. And I begin walking with two walking sticks, then with one walking stick, and then without any walking sticks. And in April, I tell my wife, Jackie, that I'd like to try riding my bike. And I haven't ridden my bike uh, in six years. She says, well, you know, maybe in the fall, things keep going well, well, we can get your bike out. Well, two weeks later, I really want to try riding my bike. It's Mother's Day, and we have this emergency family meeting. Jackie tells my 16-year-old boy, who's six foot five, football player, big guy, uh, you jog alongside on the left. She tells my daughter, who's 13, you jog alongside on the right, and she'll follow. And we get in position, and I push off, and I bike around the block. You know, that big 16-year-old boy, he's crying. The 13-year-old, she's crying. Jackie's crying. And when I talk about this even now, you know, my voice gets tight and I I start crying because that was when I knew that the, the current understanding of secondary progressive multiple sclerosis is incomplete and who knows how much recovery might be possible. So I begin biking every day, a little bit more. And then in October, Jackie says, let's sign you up for the courage ride. It's 18.5 miles. However far you go, 
will be a triumph. And I have to rest a couple times, but I bike the whole way. And so when I cross the finish line, we're all crying. My kids are crying, Jackie's crying, I'm crying. And this fundamentally changes how I think about disease and health and the way I practice medicine and the focus of the research that I do. And forgive me, I have to wipe my nose because I can't tell that story without crying. Well, I can imagine being a mom with children that are still in school, you know, in junior high and high school. And, you know, as they're watching their mom, the prognosis of what's going on and it's, you know, it's not looking good, like you said. And then, then there was this massive turning point where things start to improve and improve gradually at first. And then kind of, in a miraculous kind of way, things that most have never seen when it comes to the progression of MS in terms of recovery. I can imagine that was a massive moment, especially on Mother's Day. Um, you know, and then <clears throat> the uh, following Sunday, when I tell my folks at the church that I attend, uh, and I start to tell the story, and I start crying. Then Jackie uh, finishes the story. Of course, everyone is so excited for me because they had seen the dramatic decline. That was a, a, a very remarkable time uh, in our lives. And of course, I'm crying again, I'm yeah. living that moment. I'm, cry- I'm about to cry as a, as, a, as a mama and fellow practitioner, and just so that just that journey. I have Hajimoto's thyroiditis that we have in remission. I've read I've read your books so many times, just because I know that it translates into so much, so many different types of autoimmunity um, that I want to speak into later in this conversation. But like you said, that realization that what we know about second progression of multiple sclerosis, it, we, you just blew it up, right? You just opened the door for the possibility of faster and more progressive type of recovery. You know, it, it, what is wild? Um, so I, I had this remarkable uh, recovery. I began talking where I was invited to churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, uh, community colleges. People in the MS world uh, thought I was really very dangerous, that I was creating this uh, false hope, that I was painting a story that just does not happen. Uh, They said I never had MS, that my physicians were incompetent. Clearly, I had something else because progressive MS does not reverse. And now, fortunately, I'd seen the very best MS centers in the country, multiple MS centers. I'm also a little socially oblivious. All this criticism, I didn't really notice. It was hard for my family. And fortunately for me, my chair of medicine and my chief of staff at the VA thought I should do a clinical trial testing. Could this work in others with progressive MS? And so they got me the mentors and I changed the focus of my research, which had been diagnostic error, into doing clinical trials. As you know, uh, that first study uh, was remarkably successful. Uh, People could implement this complicated regimen. The biggest side effect was if you were overweight, you lost weight without being hungry. And you got back to the weight that you were at in your early 20s. And then as a group, we held their walking function stable, which is stunning because you'd expect a 10 to 15% worsening every year. And half of the folks had clinically meaningful improvement of either hand function or walking function. And as a group, we had remarkable reduction in fatigue, improvement in quality of life, reduction in anxiety, depression, uh, improvement in verbal reasoning and nonverbal reasoning. Truly, uh, really quite remarkable. That's incredible. And I know that because of what you guys saw in that first trial, that the research has continued or like decreased the amount of criticism that you've been getting. And I can imagine when, when you get a diagnosis like MS and it's progressed so much for you, it it can be really hard to imagine that there being a reduction in symptoms or reversal. Certainly people who have progressive neurologic disorders, one of the uh, very important strategies is that you let go of the future. You just learn to teach each day as it unfolds. You know, I'm up walking around remarkably better, less fatigue, mental clarity, less pain. But because I'd let go of the future, I didn't know what any of it meant. It wasn't until I got on that bike and I biked around the block. I'm like, well, what this means is we really don't know how much recovery might be possible. And so now what is remarkable is I can jog 20 minutes. I can jog two miles. Now, it took me years of physical therapy and hard work to get that far back. And I've seen uh, remarkable recoveries 
in others with progressive MS with likewise very similar intense disabilities who are willing to do really extensive physical therapy, really work at it and, and realize that this is uh, going to be uh, hard work. It, it, interestingly enough, the people who've been most successful are former athletes because they understand that physical training, uh, you have big goals, you have intermediate goals, and it is years worth of work to achieve uh, really big goals. I want to talk a little bit deeper into you, and I'm so grateful that you, yeah, that you explained that it's not a walk in the park to get these, this type of reversal and to make these types of changes with progressive multiple sclerosis. Um, but I know that in your clinical trial, the two areas that you've looked at is the efficacy of diet. Love to talk a little bit about diet, not only what has worked for you, but also what have you seen in the clinical trial? And then, you know, what, what does it look like in terms of quality of life? for people with multiple yeah. So uh, we've done a bunch of uh, randomized control trials of the uh, paleo diet, the ketogenic diet. Uh, we also included a study of the low fat diet. Uh, and consistently we find that you improve your diet, fatigue goes down, quality of life goes up, mental health, physical health, quality of life improves. My colleague, Dr. Snutzler and Dr. Titcomb did a really uh, interesting study called a network meta-analysis. And in that kind of study, you take other randomized controlled studies that have been done of, of diet in the study of MS that looked at their impact on fatigue and quality of life. And then they uh, combine them and do something called a standardized mean difference uh, to measure what was the level of fatigue reduction or improvement in quality of life. And uh, through this statistical means, they can go from the most effective to the least effective. It's how MS studies rank order how effective uh, the various drugs are. So this let them rank order the effectiveness of diet. So for fatigue, it went the modified paleo diet, which basically is the Walls diet, the Mediterranean diet, and then the low-fat diets, which are the Swank diet and the McDougall diets. And then for improving quality of life, there's just two diets, the modified paleo diet and the Mediterranean diet. The other diets that were not reliably effective were the ketogenic diet, uh, anti-inflammation diet, a fasting pattern, and calorie restriction. And then, the, of course, the usual diet, which is absolutely not effective. And then because we can get a sense of the relative effectiveness, the paleo diet it basically is about 50% more effective than the Mediterranean diet or the uh, low-fat diet for fatigue, and about 50% more effect, well, about twice as effective as the Mediterranean diet for improving quality of life. My message though, you know, and I think uh, Snutzler's message and Titcomb's message is, you gotta fix your diet, you know, according to what you and your family can do, and also your clinical comorbidities. So if you've been told to follow a low-fat diet because uh, you have severe elevations of your cholesterol, then, you know, by all means, do the low-fat diet. If what speaks to you is the Mediterranean diet, do that. If you want the diet with the highest effect size and realize that, yes, it is more work, then you do the modified paleo diet. Let's talk a little bit about the modified paleo diet, which is really the walls diet. It's yours. Correct. And you'll find that in the walls protocol in the book. I'll have a link in there. I believe you may be, you have a new book coming out, but if not, that's the book I'll make sure to have in the, in the show notes and whatever else you would love to have me have Terry inside of our show notes, but talk to me about the modified walls diet. And this is a diet that consistently you have been on since 2007 or 2000. Correct. So it's what I've been on since 2007. Now I, I continue to refine and learn as I go and I put it in levels so that, and the way you can think about this is we have the standard American diet, then the next level up really is the Mediterranean diet, rich in olive oil, beans, fish, grass-finished meats, lots of vegetables. Good diet, and you can still having uh, gluten and dairy in that. You could then take gluten and dairy out and do a gluten-free version of the Mediterranean diet, which looks pretty similar to Wall's level one, really. And so you could do that as a more vegetables, particularly greens, sulfur rich, cabbage, onion, mushroom family, in deeply colored things like beets, carrots, berries. You have to have protein because we need protein to make all of our, our structures. And you can do it as a vegetarian or a vegan with beans and rice or with meat uh, and fish if you're 
an omnivore, that is, uh, you're eating animal products. I take eggs out, in part because eggs are a big problem for me. If I have eggs, it turns on my face pain. And the IRB, in their wisdom, required me to have use my study diet uh, when I did my first study. And then the nature of research is that you always build on your earlier studies. So I've continued to carry that diet forward uh, in my other studies. We add in uh, fermented foods, organ meats, heart, tongue, liver, gizzards, because uh, they have so many uh, great uh, nutrients in them. We add uh, nutritional yeast. I add seaweed, algae, uh, like corolla as well, again, for their beneficial nutrient profile and the beneficial effect they have on the microbiome. And then I have a ketogenic version for people who have more, a lot of history of the ketogenic diet for people with seizure disorders, uh, about a hundred years worth of history, as a matter of fact. More recently, we've been using that for people with insulin resistance, cancers, and uh, cognitive decline. And there is certainly emerging research that looks very exciting for the ketogenic diet being very helpful for people with autoimmunity, uh, including people with multiple sclerosis. And we are comparing the modified paleo diet and the keto diet to the usual diet in the clinical trial that we're doing right now. Quick question, and, um, the modified keto diet, which is the WALS protocol versus a ketogenic, could you modify the WALS to be more keto focused? It's the level three, uh, and I have two versions of that. One that uh, emphasizes coconut oil, MCTs. Uh, and the advantage of that is you get to have more carbs, and so it's easier to follow. If you like coconut milk and coconut oil, uh, it's really quite delicious. Coconut milk, I think, is, is really quite delicious. The downside is it may drive your cholesterol up. Knowing what we know about cholesterol and, and looking at low density lipoprotein versus high density, because obviously the cholesterol profile can get a little bit more complex. Is there, I mean, and I guess it, it depends like is when it comes to lessening symptoms or reversing symptoms of, of MS, I guess you just weigh that against potential more cardiometabolic concerns. You, you want to have a diet that people are going to be safe on long term. Okay. Uh, for the rest of their life, because uh, whatever diet that they have success with, we would want them to keep that going the rest of their life. Therefore, and I also want to point out to everyone listening that most ketogenic diets are very heavy into eggs, very heavy into dairy fat, which I'm telling people are inflammatory. So yeah. we don't want you using those fats. Uh, I'd much rather you use avocados uh, in uh, olive oil. Uh, therefore, uh, it's also greatly reduces the anxiety in the internal medicine community and the cardiologist if we're putting someone on a ketogenic diet that is based on olive oil as opposed to one that's based on eggs and butter. That makes sense. Yeah, because when I was thinking about a ketogenic protocol that was a variation of your protocol of the modified paleo, I was just thinking more added avocado and olive oil and nuts and seeds. I wasn't thinking we would bring back dairy or eggs. I know even well, no, no. And obviously, I would not do that. So people are looking at keto recipes, keto blogs, keto information in the public space. We have that difficulty with our study. People are in our study. They're on a keto diet. They're looking at all these keto blogs, and they're wanting to lean way into eggs uh, and dairy. I'm like, no, no, no. We're, we're not doing that. We are leaning into olive oil. Got it. Okay. And so probably safe to say, like you said, in terms of a reduction of symptoms, a reversal of some symptoms when it comes to multiple sclerosis, and really we can extend that out into potentially autoimmune protocols, not just neurodegenerative protocols, but that the modified um, walls protocol is probably the one that's going to get us the best results. We certainly have found that, so there are many more people with psoriasis and autoimmune skin disorders and autoimmune thyroid disorders than there are with multiple sclerosis. And we find those communities find me and they come say, you know what? I got your book. And it made all the difference in the world. I've been taking all of those disease modifying drug treatments and still struggling with my skin disorder. I went on your protocol. I am great. And I've been able to reduce and get off those uh, disease-modifying drugs. 
I so appreciate you giving clarity on that as well. I want to speak into, I, I love it because I have a protocol that I offer my, it's not as extensive as yours, but it's, it's no grains, no processed grains, sugar, eggs, dairy, processed meat, obviously processed meat. Yeah eggs, corn, you know, those type of foods, it's very much a kind of more autoimmune friendly, modified paleo protocol that has just been phenomenal for reversing insulin resistance, even, you know, even more so and helping to support women with autoimmune conditions. It's not as in depth as yours, but it makes such a massive difference when you cut a lot of those inflammatory foods out, even ones that people don't necessarily consider inflammatory. Correct. You know, corn uh, can be a problem. It can be a lot of cross reactivity with corn. Uh, people feel like, okay, it's, there's no gluten in it. It's not. It's wheat free. It should be fine. But there is considerable uh, cross reactivity, and many of the other ancient grains, likewise, still have gluten and gliadin components as well. I want to talk a little bit about. In a, I don't know how how strict the supplement regimen is. I know Dr. Walls, you're still on a pretty solid supplement regimen. You know, I know that the diet is looked at so much so here in the clinical trials, and I would love to talk about it in, in relation to how we look at drug trials for MS as well. But I also want to dive into the importance of supplements, at least you have found in your own personal case, but I'm not sure if you've also looked at clinical trials well, or supplementation. You know, I want to point out to everyone is most of us have probably had five to 10 years of damage to our tissues uh, in that autoimmune prodrome before the diagnosis. And so we have a much higher nutritional requirement for repair and rebuilding than if we had been healthy the whole time. In my own personal case, I feel much better when I'm taking my supplements. I do think it's helpful to have a functional medicine uh, practitioner help you think through your, your medical symptoms, your comorbidities, and ideally, you could get some nutritional assessments to see how deep a hole you're in to help guide your replacement, and then to monitor you as time goes on. Uh, because m many nutrients have what we call a U-shaped curve. So if you have too little of the nutrient, you have a disease state. And if you have too much of a nutrient, you can develop a disease state because a lot of our nutrients are tied to two or three nutrients for the same transporter receptor that takes it into your system. There's a broad range where we have good health, and then another broad range where we have eh, maybe marginal health, and then we have a disease state. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where working with a practitioner to help you monitor to know, are you in that broad range of good health, in the range of eh, you're developing some problems, or you're going to be in the range of disease state. Got it. I so appreciate that, that kind of context around supplementation specifically. I'd love to talk a little bit about, because I, you know, I don't know if people really understand the kind of the difference between diet studies differing from drug studies, especially when we're talking yeah. about multiple sclerosis, when, when a lot of the studies are pointed to drug studies. Yeah. So drugs are built around a single molecular pathway that we're going to uh, target a receptor to make it uh, go up or down. Uh, and that's pretty easy because now I can take a placebo or the active drug and the investigator, the patient, uh, they don't know. It's simple. It's easy to do. If I use a supplement, I could likewise make placebos uh, and that would be easy to do. If I'm going to use food, people know what they're going to eat. If I use meditation or exercise or electrical stimulation, they know, are they, are they doing that or not? Uh, and so it's a different kind of study. It's a different kind uh, of investigation. And one of the, the big things that I did for the MS Society, when they decided that they were going to have to do diet and wellness research, I said, you have to have different scientists for your peer review of the protocols, because this is not at all like a drug study. You need to have registered dietitians who have PhDs to evaluate the drug, the uh, diet studies. You need to have physical medicine and rehab docs to help evaluate the rehab studies, because good rehabilitation is going to involve great nutrition, 
a physical therapy, maybe occupational therapy, maybe speech therapy, maybe uh, talk therapy of some type. It's a very complementary multimodal intervention. And as a matter of fact, the MS Society just put out, I'm so proud of them. They asked for rehab studies. And once again, I uh, met with the program officer and said, you need to really get uh, physical medicine rehab clinicians who are doing rehab in clinical practice on these review panels and not just the scientists. So ho hopefully they're listening. And I'm hopeful that they are. When it comes, I was thinking about when it comes to this kind of clinical trials and this research, it's just more complex. It's more complex. It's much, it's much more complicated. It, and um, it's much more complicated to do because it, imagine, we'll just say I'm, I'm going to do, use just diet. I'm going to take people who are following the standard American diet, who most of whom have, don't know how to shop, meal plan, or cook. We're going to have them learn new recipes new ingredients. They have to learn how to meal plan. They're probably fatigued, so we have to uh, teach them how to how to do all these things. And then the people who are willing to be randomized to a diet study, they don't want to be in the control arm because they've decided, okay, I want to improve my diet. I'm willing to make changes. And in the consent, I have to describe the intervention diet in, in plenty of detail. So the control arm can say, I don't feel like being on the control. I'm going to follow the intervention diet as well as they can based on my consent, which I outlined the diet. The control diets always improve compared to the standard American diet. And the control group always improves at least somewhat. And then the intervention diet presumably will improve because we designed the diet very uh, systematically. Yeah, thanks for giving a little bit of clarity and context into what did that what that actually looks like and and how how difficult. Like, I just love that you are taking such a big undertaking, like your, your passion and your purpose is I mean, definitely doesn't go unnoticed over here. That's for sure. I want to shift lanes for a second because I know there were many years, like you said, that often we're developing these autoimmune conditions and have no idea. And then, and then one day we get this diagnosis. And I know for you, you know, probably even with trigeminal diagnosis, trigeminal neuralgia, there probably was signs and symptoms of MS then too. Are you looking at all in terms of what does it look like for early detection or what can we do? Ah, yes. So there's more recognition that systemic autoimmune disease, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and probably also Hashimoto's. I don't know the literature for psoriasis. There is a 10 to 15 years of prodrome. And the, the prodrome is pretty typical for all of these disease states higher rates of chronic uh, headache, higher rates of migraines, higher rates of uh, severe uh, pelvic pain with your periods, uh, heavy blood flow, higher rates of infertility, higher rates of skin rashes, higher rates of uh, eczema, higher rates of fatigue, higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of depression. So those conditions are part of a prodrome that if we don't figure out what are the root causes, that are contributing to why you have all of those conditions, you are at much greater rate of developing multiple sclerosis, of developing inflammatory bowel disease, of developing rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus. And then, you know, I can look at my own personal history. Okay, so how many of those prodromes did I have? I had migraines. I struggled with depression uh, since I was an adolescent. I had uh, severe bleeding uh, in uh, pelvic pain with my periods. I just thought, okay, that's just a lot of life. You know, don't complain about it. So it is. <laughs> it happens to us all. So, you know, don't complain. Uh, and then when I decided I wanted to have kids, I was struggling with getting uh, pregnant. So I had infertility. Then uh, we did an ultrasound and they said, oh, you've got uh, ovarian cysts. Uh, matter of fact, you need to have surgery. Uh, and should have surgery next week because you have a really large ovarian cyst uh, and uh, this might be ovarian cancer. So I had the surgery and said, no, 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 what you have is severe endometriosis all throughout uh, your pelvis. We did remove the ovarian cyst. We, we, we saved your ovaries for you. So migraines, headache, depression, infertility, endometriosis. Which I believe in, in the research is looking at endometriosis being an autoimmune condition. It's an autoimmune problem. You know, there are 80 confirmed autoimmune diagnoses and another couple hundred that have autoimmune processes that I predict we will eventually say, oh yeah, they are an autoimmune disease. Yeah. I so often I see women with, with, with endo eventually get Hajimoto's or maybe fibromyalgia and 
we will see more than one. So, so yeah, we see a cluster of inflammatory issues that kind of aren't adding up, you know, and we're not putting the pieces together until at some point, maybe a bigger autoimmune condition arises from it. When I first started changing how I practice medicine, and I started talking to my patients about their diet, their lifestyle, uh, my partners, it drove them crazy. Like, you know, my chief of staff called me and said, you know, Terry, people are complaining that you're using the same intervention for every disease state. Every disease you encounter, you get the same intervention. And I'm like, well, I am just trying to help their cells function a little bit better. We all have mitochondria, we all have cell membranes, and that's the focus of the nutritional intervention that I'm giving. Said, well, okay. And so how can I hurt people by telling them to eat more vegetables and to take a good multivitamin and a B vitamin? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about a <sighs> mitochondrial dysfunction. That's amazing yeah. for a lot of a lot of disease. Um, I know that that's been an area that you really focus on optimizing. At the very least, we know that when we have dysfunctional mitochondria, we're going to feel pretty tired. We're going to feel pretty brain fogged. But we know research, more and more research is coming out that light mitochondrial dysfunction is lending to cardiometabolic disease and cancer and autoimmune conditions. And so what what is your take on what we can do from a preventative standpoint? Because I feel like we're all of us are damaging our mitochondria. Yeah, we, we all are. So. Uh, there, there's two components. One is to stop damaging your mitochondria, and the other is to nourish your mitochondria. So in terms of stop damaging your mitochondria, a lot of the toxins that we are encountering in what's called the exposome, everything that we're exposed to, they work by interfering with the um, electron transport chain, which is a fancy way of saying all of those enzymatic steps that the mitochondria use to generate ATP. And so the heavy metals compete with um, the role for zinc and magnesium that should be facilitating these chemical reactions in the mitochondria. But if you don't have enough zinc and magnesium, the cadmium, arsenic, mercury will displace and will poison those enzymes. Then the pesticides, that we use to kill and um, uh, bug companies uh, use around uh, buildings in industry in our homes to control infestation of ants and other and termites and, and other stuff. Those pesticides will also poison those electron transport uh, uh, chemical reactions as well. Again, you know, coenzyme Q, a key constituent of some of those enzymes as well. Uh, our B vitamins uh, all have roles to play in facilitating uh, those chemical reactions. And then when people think about our vitamins, they often forget that the vitamins, in addition to having you know, your thiamine, B1, uh, your folate, uh, B2, your niacin, B3, or folate, B9, uh, or cobalamin, B12, that they also have uh, mineral cofactors. And so if we're depleted in our minerals, even if we have enough vitamins, it's going to be a problem. And if our soils, uh, in part because we've been using uh, glyphosate uh, in the form of Roundup to keep the weeds down, and now there's uh, additional herbicides added because the, the plants are now resistant to glyphosate, they bind minerals. So the plants are becoming mineral depleted. That means the grains that we feed our livestock are mineral depleted. and the uh, minerals in meat are some of the most readily absorbed, and the meat has fewer and fewer minerals, which is why uh, you know, dairy cattle die at younger and younger ages. I could wax eloquent here, but our food supply is less and less nutritious, and that adds to our compromise. I was curious, I, I know that this plays a major role and obviously there's hormetic stresses that we can put on our mitochondria, there's minerals and, and supplementation, like you said, specifically to feed the electron transport chain like CoQ10 and acetyl L-carnitine. But it's, you know, I know it's, it, there's, it's a multifaceted approach, not only to reduce our toxic load that's affecting our mitochondria, but also to help build up and create resilience for our mitochondria. Um, and yeah, there's definitely a lot of lifestyle, but I think it's something that we just have to be diligently consistent with every single day. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So reduce your, your toxic exposures, huge first step, and then improving your nutrition uh, is second step. 
And the reason why I'm asking is, it's, you know, we're talking about root cause and, you know, that ultimately autoimmune conditions do have a root cause and their lifestyle, their environmental. Um, and with so many women getting diagnosed with either, you know, I was, I was just reading a lot of statistics that 88% of women have some level of cardiometabolic dysfunction by the time they're 45 years old. And that two thirds of, of Alzheimer patients are women. And that 75% of autoimmune patients are females. And it's like, so, you know, just looking at the landscape of what are things that we could be doing on a preventive, preventative level, um, you know, if we're starting to see some of these signs show up, things like migraines and symptoms of estrogen dominance and, and you know, uh, digestive yeah. issues, kind of getting in front of it before these explode into something more serious. Correct. And, and so in my practice, I, I, the very first thing I ask people to do is think about what is your why? Why do you want to go on this journey? Because it's going to be work. And to be willing to do the work, um, it will be have a very helpful to have a lot of clarity as to what is going to help you to be willing to do this. Often it's uh, for our children, our grandchildren, our spouse. Some every, every now and then, some woman is incredibly insightful. Say, no, because of me, I got to be feeling better. So I, I endorse that. That's a great reason as well. Um, so you got to be embrace your why, and then. Then I have a conversation. What is the domain you want to work on first? Because it's probably easiest to do one things one at a time. And nutrition, very impactful. I love it when people want to start there. Sometimes people don't aren't ready to start there, uh, and they're ready to start on meditation and mindfulness. And so we'll start there. Others, what they're ready to start on is their exercise program, or their sleep program, or the practice of gratitude. And I used to be very dogmatic that, no, no, you, got, you have to start on diet. And I finally let go of that and realized that I need to let people tell me where they want to start. And then once we figure out the domain they want to start on, then my next approach is it's far easier to add than to subtract. So the first thing when we have the domain worked out, we work on what are the ads for that domain. So if, if we'll, we'll take food. So they've decided they want to work on food. So before I ask them to remove stuff, um, we'll talk about their diet and work out what are the ads. And so I, I'll talk about the green leafy vegetables, the cabbage, onion, mushroom family vegetables, and the color. We work out their ads. They get their ads firmly in hand. Then when they next time they come see me, uh, or actually they're working with my health coach. So uh, so the first week is all about the ads. The second week is okay. Let's talk about the subtractions. Then we talk about uh, sugar, processed foods, uh, fast foods, gluten, dairy, and eggs. Again, I have the patient sort out what day is their start day so they can negotiate when that's going to be and what are the things they're going to add and how will the family support you. And I explain that for all of us, things that we're addicted to, if we see them, they're going to find our mouth and we'll be chewing and eat, eating them before we know it. So it will be very helpful if your family can agree that you don't have to see it anymore. And what does that mean? Does it mean you don't see it at your meal? You don't see it in the kitchen? You don't see it in, in the cupboard? Uh, you and your family can work out what you're not having to look at it means. Mm -hmm. uh, and the family should get to eat what they want when they're away from you. But they aren't going to come home and talk to you about just how wonderful that pizza and beer was. And I, and I hope that the family is, is okay with it just not being in the house. You know, it, it's amazing how easy. It's so helpful. Done. Now, some, some families uh, decide that it can be in the house, uh, but they're going to put it on a, in a separate room. Uh, they're going to put it on uh, a high shelf that I can't reach without getting the step ladder out. And it's so it, it, it can't coated to that cabinet really high. Yeah. That and it's and no one's going to consume it in my present. So the family can have a conversation as to what does my not having to watch it look like mean for the family. And sometimes we have to have uh, a referral for family therapy. In my experience, when a family can't have a conversation over that that works well for um, how you're going to support me not having to watch this. When that's a struggle, it's a symptom of a family in crisis, that there's family conflict, family struggle, that uh, someone's already checked out of the relationship, someone 
uh, is contemplating uh, leaving. They no longer want to be in this partnership anymore. Family conversation with a skilled talk therapist can sometimes negotiate a more effective communication that probably has been broken for a long time and uh, may be able to repair that family to a much more satisfactory uh, working relationship. When I can imagine the stress of a diagnosis like MS definitely puts a lot of uh, more strain on a relationship or a family at large. And then it, is, to- it is very hard. Uh, and families, now this isn't uniform, but uh, when women are diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, uh, men are more unlikely to leave than if a man is diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, women are a little more likely to stay. I certainly have met wonderful men who have stood by their spouses and have been uh, really a phenomenal support. And I've met men who have been uh, treated poorly uh, by their former spouses who abandoned them. Interesting. I know that it just gets really complex. So I really, I do appreciate you laying out kind of those first steps of what it looks like. So once you get a diagnosis and you are willing to do a lot of the lifestyle changes that are going to potentially keep where you're at at bay or even reverse some of these symptoms. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly that diet's the first place we got to play, but I also appreciate your grace that you're willing to meet people where they're at. (laughs) I I feel like I'm in the dogma of like, we got to work on this diet. So I want people to work on their diet. Um, I will refer them to uh, talk therapists who can help them with their mindfulness. I will refer them to physical therapists who can help them with their exercise. I will, uh, but if you want to work with me, you're going to have to do work on the whole program. I'll refer you to other specialists who can work with uh, individual components for you. But if you're going to be part, if you're going to come see me as a patient, we're going to expect that you will begin working on everything. And it may be step by step by step, uh, one area at a time, but we will expect that you're willing to do everything. I appreciate that. And then I know um, in terms of where we're directing people, as I said, I'll have the book as well. It's such a beautiful starting place because you really lay it out. But also you have clinical trials going if people want to learn more about yeah. it. And then you've got a little kind of- a Oh, little- hang on. Let, let me tell people about the clinical trial so they can mm-hmm. tell their friends and their colleagues, help me recruit. Uh, we're comparing a olive oil-based ketogenic diet a, the modified paleo diet to usual diet. Uh, people will come at uh, month zero, month three, month 24. We'll get measures of mood, fatigue, quality of life, measures of walking, hand, vision, uh, and thinking function. And we'll get a brain MRI using a uh, research magnet, so no contrast. And we'll measure change in brain volume uh, over two years. The big question we're asking uh, is can we improve quality of life uh, in these uh, all these functions that I've just mentioned? And the other question that I think is super interesting is uh, because people with MS have higher rates of brain volume loss than we see in healthy aging. Healthy aging has brain volume loss less than 0.3% per year. MS on average has brain volume loss of 1% per year. Can a improved diet get you back to healthy rates of brain volume loss. That's the big hypothesis. Uh, I think that'll be the most exciting uh, paper that comes out of uh, this study. Uh, The improved quality of life uh, in various functions I think will be exciting. But, you know, disease modifying drugs do a great job of turning off enhancing lesions of turning off relapses. They do not do a very good job of improving quality of life, reducing uh, fatigue, reducing anxiety or depression. And they do not at all do a good job of getting people to healthy rates of brain volume loss. I'm excited to see what you guys discover. It's gonna gonna be so exciting. I have a feeling, I have a good feeling that we're gonna, you're gonna see what you're gonna- Yeah, so we're, we're gonna have 156 people in the study we have uh, consented 75, so we're, we'll, we're almost halfway there. Uh, and I think we'll be recruiting for another year, uh, and then we'll, we'll be done. We follow people for two years. It will be probably 2025 that we'll be analyzing our results and probably presenting this at some big MS uh, scientific meetings in 2026. Well, 
Dr. Wald, I so appreciate you coming on the show and, you know, really updating us on the current research and what we can do, but then also speaking into what we should be looking out for and what are some preventative steps as well. So I really appreciate the multifaceted conversation today. Thank you. All right. I'll have all the links in the show notes. Everyone check it out. I'll have the link for what's going on with the clinical trials. I will also have the book as well. If there's friends and family that you know um, that are interested in these trials or that want to learn more about Dr. Wall's work, especially if they've got an autoimmune condition or specifically if they've got multiple sclerosis, please go and share these links with them. Dr. Wall, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day.